All right, let's play. Philosophy is the noblest game, so therefore we have a right to say, let's play. As you can see from this, I've changed the title. And in the end, I'll go back to the official title. So therefore, I'm going to start with Plato's allegory for the training of the soul, and then return to the real subject later. You notice the difference? Good. All right, let's play. First, what is an allegory? How do you construct it? How do you construct an allegory? All right. To play with allegories means first that you know how to generate them, how to develop them, so then you can turn around and understand them. That's the goal. An allegory starts with a four-term analogy. An analogy can be represented as A is to B, as C is to D. You can also use numbers. Two is to four, as three is to six. You can also use ideas. Shepherd is to his sheep, as a ruler is to his subjects. Once you have your basic four terminology, you generate analogies by principle. All right? So first, you start with your first four terminology. Then you have to expand the number of terms in each ratio or progression. Then, once you've done that, you have to introduce a drama, a storyline that's going to dramatize a fundamental but most significant issue. These are the four parts of any allegory. Again, how about you start with four terminology? What do you then do? You expand it. Then what? You introduce a drama or a storyline. Fourth, that storyline must represent some fundamental issue, fundamental to the nature of man. Now, what is going to be our four terminology? Now, the Jawad translation translates the opening lines of Plato's allegory of the cave using these two terms the unenlightened and the enlightened. And that's, I think, the proper way to translate it. So this is our four terminology. The unenlightened are to the enlightened as cave dwellers are to those living in the upper world. A is to B as C is to D. Now, in order to develop an allegory, you take the four terms and you expand them. How do you expand them and what does that mean? It means that you have been able to understand a process and you can understand that process in terms of stages. Then you transfer those stages and processes to the second set. So therefore, you have an equivalence between the two. Not same, but similar relations. As an example, shepherd, right? Shepherd is to sheep, as ruler is to his subjects. No ruler is going to take care of his subjects in the same way a shepherd takes care of his sheep, it's in a similar way, not the same way. Therefore, there's always going to be a difference. All right, now, 
What are the stages and the processes and how do we represent them? How do we find them? Well, whatever steps it is necessary for the seeker to go through as he proceeds through the unenlightened to the enlightened, whatever are the stages, these are the stages, whatever those stages are, presupposes there's going to be some process that brings them through each of those stages. Now, that means we're able to take a look at the whole problem of enlightenment and say they are definable stages in that transition from one to the other. That means there is a definite number that can be distinguished, right? A definite number. Not an infinite number and not one, but a definite number of stages. Now, let us assume for the moment that we can talk about it, we can represent what we think are the stages necessary for anyone to go through when they seek this process of reaching for enlightenment. Once we've identified them, let's just represent them for the moment with A, B, C, etc. All right. Then when we're talking about our cave, dwever, cave dwellers, they have to have the principal characteristics of the unenlightened. What must they have? The characteristics. Therefore, the cave dwellers, however we are going to portray them, they are going to have to be described in the in the most accurate terms that represents what is it about man that keeps him unenlightened? What is it about man that keeps him unenlightened? Put that into words, that's a characteristic, represent that among the cave dwellers. First step. Second step. Remember we said there was a series of stages that led someone from the unenlightened to the enlightened. Each one of them, each one of these, must be represented in our story as someone moving from the cave to the upper world. Therefore, we're going to represent them in our story so that we can see a similar set of characteristics that represent the relationships between one and the other. That's our goal. What are we doing now, just quickly? We're going to look at the problem of enlightenment. We're going to study it. We want to see if we can define certain stages that men typically go through, mankind typically goes through, in the quest for enlightenment. If we can identify the key stages that they face as they go through this process and represent them, describe them so we can represent them, then those same stages we should be able to represent symbolically through images that the cave dwellers take as they try to struggle in their effort to get out of the cave and live in the upper world. Whatever process, now we're on processes now, before, before we were talking about stages. Now, what is a process? That is something that you do that gets you from one to the other. See? It, sometimes it's called a method. Now, in the same way, if there is going to be the stages, equally well, there must be a process that the cave dweller takes as he equally ascends into the upper world. Now, I'm going to represent what he goes through, the experiences the person goes through here. The first thing that's going to occur, now I'm going to stay on the level of the myth. I shouldn't call it a myth, by the way. The allegory. I'm going to represent the cave dwellers typically experiencing the following things. At first, when they're turned around and they have to then be challenged 
in the quest for enlightenment, it hurts them, it puzzles them. Second, in order to continue this quest, they're going to have to be compelled to go on. There has to be some urgency behind them. They're not going to do it without being compelled. They are going to feel, again, hurt, hurt in a more serious way, and they're going to try to seek to escape back into their prior state, the unenlightened state. Therefore, they must be dragged up. They will be in great distress, and they'll often show great fury. That's the original. That's a set. A, B, C. That's a set. Typical set. Next. Then, repeatedly, by going through it again, again, they have to get used to it. There's no way out. Then there's a stage after this. They go through, and lastly, they go through yet another stage. Now, I would like to go into the language of that for a moment. All right. And let's talk about geography while we do that. All right? Geography. Geography of an allegory. So far, we're talking about people going through stages and going through a process. But there must also be, as it were, the furniture of the allegory, the furniture. There's a wall. There are prisoners who are chained, fettered. They're fettered in such a way that they cannot turn around to see one another. Therefore, the only thing they see is shadows of themselves cast on the wall of the cave. They can't turn their necks around, therefore they can't see the source of other things that are flittering and as shadows on the wall of that cave. And that is that there's a raised platform here where men are carrying objects on their heads. The fire beyond that. And that fire generates light which casts the images Again, shadows on the wall of the cave of these very objects. <clears throat> That's what we're calling the furniture. The wall, A. The shadows, B. The other set of shadows, C. The chains, D. The men fettered the way they are, E. The raised platform, F. The men who walk back and forth, G. The objects on their head, H. The fire, I. That's what we're calling the geography, the furniture, the furniture of the allegory. Again, in the upper world, it is further described, and we can describe it, and we can read the story, and make sure we have all the pieces in it. I happen to be very good at drawing cats, since we need animals in the upper world. And, of course, there are Curiously enough, pools of water up here. Now, <clears throat> this is the cave, this is the upper world. In the same way, we have to have a set of terms that identify the geography in the cave and in the upper world. <clears throat> now, each one of these objects has a referent. Each one of these has a referent. It must represent something. It must represent something very significant in how it functions. 
It re represents a function. It's an image of a function. It's an image of a function. Right? Therefore, it represents a function. It's an image of a function. Now, <clears throat> that's the allegory. That's the allegory. In terms of only the expansion of the number of terms, because we're now saying the unenlightened are to the cave dwellers as the enlightened are to those living in the upper world. We have now identified these terms in the geography and now we have to introduce a drama, a story. Now, this is a allegory that reaches through 20 pages of Plato's allegory. The allegory that gave in the upper world goes through at least 20 pages. As a matter of fact, it goes through right to the end of book seven. But let me just deal with the principal parts for a moment. All right? I'd like to read you now a small section of it so you can see exactly where the drama enters in. I'm using the Rouse and I may jump back into the lobe for various reasons. So, I'm in the beginning of book seven. Okay. Now, what does this uh, represent? This whole thing must represent something. Remember we said there has to be some fundamental issue. It represents the condition of man. in respect to only one thing. The possible development of man from unenlightened to enlightened. That's the condition of man. Therefore, it really is the condition of man's possible spiritual evolution. So let me just read you a couple of lines and then I'm going to get into the drama. All right. Next then, take the following parable of education and ignorance as a picture of the condition of our nature. As I said, I would prefer the unenlightened and enlightened because that is the way in which he describes it. Uh, let me even give you a nice quote of it. Um, the ascension and the contemplation of things above is the soul's ascension into the intelligible region. Right? That's what it is. The whole thing is the soul's contemplation of the highest levels of reality. So let me now find my quote. Okay. Imagine mankind is dwelling in an underground cave with a long entrance opened to the light across the whole width of the cave. In this they have been from childhood, not birth, childhood, with necks and legs fettered, so they have to stay where they are. Unenlightened, stay where they are. Fettered from what? From childhood, not from birth, childhood. It must be something we've learned. And so he then describes what I wrote here on the board very crudely. At the end of this one page, he then adds, now consider what their release would be like from these fetters. Now consider what their release would be like and their cure from these fetters and their folly. Let us imagine whether it might naturally be something like this. One might be released, compelled suddenly to stand up, to turn his neck around, to walk and to look towards the firelight. All this would hurt him and would be too much dazzled to see distinctly those things whose shadows he had seen before. What do you think he would say if someone told, told him that what he saw before was foolery? But now he saw rightly, being a bit nearer to, 
to, to reality and turn towards what was a little more real. What if he were shown each of the passing things and compelled by questions to answer what each one was? Do you think he would be puzzled to believe what he saw before was more true than what was shown to him now? That's the drama. That's the drama. You must have a drama to get an allegory. Therefore, we have the analogy with its expanded terms. Now, right? what would happen if one of these men were suddenly released from his chains and forced to stand up and to turn around and by questions being asked about the nature of what it is that he formerly took to be real? Now, we're going to follow him what he's going to go through are going to be the stages and the processes. Therefore, we can watch the language and we can see how it develops. And when we do that, then we're getting into the allegory and seeing how he's using it. Now, to remember which book I was in. Ah, okay. I think this one. Um, Ah, I'll use this one. I know where this one is. This is the, I got this book originally when they were selling paperbacks for 75 cents. <laughs> All right. We're going through now the, the effect it has on him. We first talked about how hurt and puzzled he was how then he's compelled to face the things that before he took to be real. <clears throat> right. Now the next step. He must be compelled to look towards the real light. It would hurt his eyes and he would escape by turning them away to the things he was able to look at and these he would believe to be clearer than what is being shown to him. Suppose now that someone would drag him hence by force up the rough ascent, the steep way up, never to stop until he, could, and, until he could drag him out into the light of the sun. Would he not be distressed and furious at being dragged? And when he came into the light, the brilliance would fill his eyes, and he would not be able to see even one of the things now called real. <clears throat> That's right. Next stage. Has to get used to it. Has to get used to this. No way out. No way out. Have to get used to it. He would have to get used to it, surely, I think, if he is to see the things above. Has to get used to the fact that this is what, this is what it's like. It's not a picnic challenges the very existence of a person and their whole view of the nature of ultimate reality. reality. Therefore, first, he would most easily look at the shadows. I see, now we're going through the allegory. After that, the images of mankind. Hey, what objects are being carried on his head happens to be images of mankind. Look here. First, he would most easily look at shadows. After that, the images of mankind. And the rest in water. And lastly, the things in themselves. Four stages. One, two, three, four. How interesting. Huh. Okay. 
after this, after this, he would find it easier now right, to survey by night the heavens themselves and all that is in them, gazing at the light of the stars, the moon, rather than by day the sun and the sun's light. Lastly, lastly, last, last of all, I suppose the sun. He would look at the sun itself, by itself in its own place and see what it's like. Not reflections of it in water as it appears in some alien setting. Now what? Now he reasons. Now he can reason. It's only now that he can truly reason. Because he has the experience upon which to reason. Look at the way he builds this, you see. And only after all this, he might reason about it. How this is he who provides seasons and years and is set over all there is in the visible region. And he is in a manner the cause of all of all the things which they saw. So then lastly, he can then reason about it. Now, he's out, reasoning about it, all of his experience, successful, next stage. There's a problem. Some people want to stay. They want to stay in the upper world. They want to stay there. And the nature of reality is overwhelmingly interesting, profound. Uh, be efficient. It's, it's a, um, an openness, a joy. They want to stay there. That becomes a problem. Then let him be reminded of his first habitation and what was wisdom in that place. And let him be reminded of his, of his fellow prisoners there. Don't you think he'd bless himself for the change and pity them? He says, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he talks about what it's like to live in the cave. And now we get, now we get, you see, a description of what's this like for these men. Now he gives us more information, so we'd have to sketch it all out. Because he's filling in the allegory for us. Watch. And if there were honors and praises among them and prizes for the one who saw the passing things most sharply, and remembered best which of them used to come before and which after and which together. And from these was best able to prophesy according to what was going to come. Do you believe he would set his desire on that and envy those who were honored men or potentates among them? Would he not feel, as Homer says, that he would much prefer to be the poorest man to a landless lord than be master of all the dead that lie here. When he looks back, right? The poorest, what would he want? He'd much prefer to be the, the poorest serf to a landless lord, a man who has nothing. What would it be like to be a slave next to someone who is absolutely poor? What would you be doing? What would you be doing? I imagine those things which the poorest man wouldn't want to do himself. Pardon me? A curious kind of slave, a landless lord, right? All right. Yes, he'd accept anything rather than live like that. All right. Just consider. If such a one should go down and sit in his old seat, would he not get his eyes full of darkness coming in suddenly out of the sun? Oh, yeah. 
And if he had to compete with those who had been always prisoners by laying down the law about those shadows while he, while he was blinking before his eyes settled down and it would take him a long time to get used to things, wouldn't they laugh at him and say he'd spoiled his eyesight by going up there and it wasn't worthwhile? And would they not kill anyone who tried to release them and take them up if they could somehow lay hands on him and kill him? They would indeed, see. Now he steps back and now he's going to give us a reflection on the whole thing because once you develop all of the terms now, you have the terms and you have the drama about what it would be like to go back down. He now then is going to consider the whole thing and raise the level of the meaning of the allegory. You must always do this when you have an allegory. Then we must apply this image, my dear Glaucon, to all we've been saying. The world of sight is like habitation in prison. Oh. Oh, this is like the world of sight. Now we're getting names of it. All right, then, this is like the world of sight. In some way, that's curious. The firelight there, now nah, the firelight there, right? This to the sunlight, here. Ah, he's making an analogy. This is like this is, this is like this. He's building now from the allegory an analogy. The ascent and the view of the upper world is the rising of the soul into the world of the mind. That's what it's all about. What is it? That's what he's saying. It's the rising of the soul into the world of the mind. Therefore, we have now the first meaning of the allegory. That's what he's telling us right there. Right? This whole thing is a way to represent the journey of the soul into the world of mind. That's terribly important in terms of the whole work. What does he mean by it? What's included in it? As you go up through this, as you go up through this, what would you be encountering? Now, I want to go back to that. That's a central part of what we're going to be doing. I just want to highlight it now by pointing out that in this division that he's making, all right, in this division he made, I'm going to call this the firelight. I'm going to raise it a bit just for, for my diagram, all right? Then I'm going to represent this realm at night. We're going to represent this realm of night as another section of this line. And those living in the upper world in the sunlight, I'm going to consider that to be the highest. All right, so I have one, two, three, four divisions. That's what he just gave me. Put it so, and you won't be far from my own surmise, since that's what you want to hear, but God knows if it's really true, at least that appears to me to be so. Now, he's now going to help us fill in this last stage. He's made the divisions. He's indicated them. This is like the world of sight, right? He's, he's, giving, us, he's giving us the terms we need. We need to add more to them as we go through it. Now he goes back into the allegory. He's going to pick on the sun, the highest term, and he's going to dress himself to what is it that it represents. So what are we getting now? We're getting identifications for the symbols or the images we're using in the allegory. Look at the way he does this. In the world of the known, Last of all is the idea of the good, and with what toil to be seen. Oh. Then this must be then related to knowing. And its object must be this curious thing that he talks about called, with a capital I, idea of the good. Now, the idea of the good in Plato, and he's going to make this point clearer, 
is the most brilliant light of being. That's what this is. That's what it means. Idea of the good. It means to behold the good. What is it? The most brilliant light of being. Now, being is the nature of ultimate reality, capital B, always a capital B. So, what's this top thing he's saying? That's knowing. Knowing what? The idea of the good. What is it? The most brilliant light of being. Ah. And seen, the idea of the good, and seen, it's an object of, 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 uh, of experience. It's capable of experience through the mind alone. And seen, this must be inferred to be the cause of all that's right and beautiful things for all. And it gives birth to light. And the king of light in the world of sight. And in the world of mind herself, the queen, produces truth and reason. And she must be seen by one who is to act with reason publicly and privately. Ah. So as we go through this allegory, he's going to fill in each one of these sections. And as he fills them, he's going to help us see how they function. Now look here. He says now he shifts. It appears to be he shifts, but then he explains himself. He says, hey, you know, the real problem is that we have something that's essential. We have something essential to man, only it's in the nature of the way we've been educated, it's turned in the wrong way. It's turned towards the visible. We direct it towards the world of becoming. Now the world of becoming, world of becoming is that world where things come into existence and pass out of existence. That's the visible world. He said, we have an eye of the soul, and so long as it's turned towards the visible or the world of becoming, it's in a barbaric block, he says. What you have to do is lift this eye of the soul out of its concern with the world of becoming, and that's the true philosophy. That you must do. You know what he calls this eye of the soul, most curious of all, he calls that the understanding. We direct our understanding and put all our attention in trying to master the visible world, the world of becoming. He said, you know what that does? That ruins it. What we have to do, therefore, is to identify the people who can make this ascent to turn their understanding around so they can enter into the world of being. What's that called? The most brilliant light of being. Idea of the good. Therefore, we have to compel the best natures to make this ascent, to ascend this ascent. Three stages. Once they do that, we have to get them to return to the cave because they see better and they can help mankind. Ah, that means we can go back into our story, you see, and we have to add to our drama. Now that he's there, he must return. Remember the way it was described before? Now he must now sit among those others, live the way they live, and then somehow help them reach a vision of reality. And that's where we're going. Let's see if I can pull a few quotes for you. First, I want to hit this idea of understanding. It's not well known, not well appreciated.
our reasoning indicates that this power is already in the soul of each and is the instrument by which each learns. See, it's the instrument by which each learns. Interesting, see? Thus, if the eye could not see without being turned with the whole body from the dark towards the light, so this instrument must be turned around with the whole soul away from the world of becoming until it's able to endure the sight of being and the most brilliant light of being. And this we say is the good, don't we? Then this instrument must have its own art for circumventing, circumturning, conversion, to show how the to show how the turn can be most easily and successfully made. It's not an art of putting sight into an eye, which it already has. But since the instrument has not been turned aright, it doesn't look where it ought to look. And that's the thing that must be managed. That's what we have to manage. You don't need to put anything in. Man already has a mind to see. It's just looking the wrong way. We've got to turn him around. But the virtue of understanding everything, you see, really belongs to something certainly more divine, as it seems. For it never loses its power. It becomes useful or helpful or, again, useless and harmful by the direction to which it's turned. Now, look here then. If we can get them to turn around and see this and experience this ultimate reality, they ascend that ascent successfully. Now we got them to turn around, get back. Look here. They are those who right? will never do anything if they can help it, believing they have already found mansions abroad in the islands of the blessed. Then it's the task of us founders to compel the best natures to attain the learning which we said was the greatest, both to see the good, to ascend that ascent, and when they have ascended and properly seen, we must never allow what is allowed now. What's that? to stay there and not be willing to descend again to those prisoners and share their troubles and their honors whether they're worth having or not. The uh, Glaucon at this point says, hey, wait a minute. Uh, are we wrong to make them uh, live badly when they might live better? Are we wrong in doing that? Socrates says, well, I'll tell you what. This whole development is to benefit all, not one. The law itself creates men like this in the city, not to allow each one of them to turn any way he likes, but in order to use them itself to the full for binding the city together. That's the goal. So we can get these people who have become masters of these twin worlds, these twin universes, or the reality and its shadow, whichever way you want to talk about it, and then allow them to function so that they can help others reach that same goal. And that will bind the city together and the soul of man. So then he says, I'm skipping a bit, so down you must go in turn to the habitation of the others and accustom yourselves to their darkness and when you've grown accustomed, you will see a thousand times better than those who live there. And you will know what the images are and what they are images of because you've seen the realities behind the just, beautiful, and good things.
Well, will uh, those who hear us uh, obey? Will they refuse to help each group in turn in the labors of the city? Especially they may want to spend most of their time dwelling in the pure air. He responds to that. He said, we'll only be laying just commands on just men. For the truth is that only if you can find for your future rulers a way of life better than ruling is it possible for you to have a well-mannered city. And then he turns it on the soul. So therefore, they return to the cave, they see better, and they can help one another so that the whole is made better and more just. Now, the progress through that entire thing <clears throat> is what is called <clears throat> the dialectic. Now we have to make stages in this dialectic and take a good look at it to see what he means. Oh, that was my last page. I should cover that up. Um, I'm going to take part of this off. Now, in the last section, in the last section, in the last lecture, we were talking about the arts in the Republic. And, of course, as you know, they were arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, harmony, <clears throat> and the dialectic. Now, when he talks about this highest art, because all of these have to come together and their kinship must be discovered. You must discover their kinship and community, why they are all together and why they should be studied together in a kinship. When that's done, you can then enter into the dialectic. Now, when he talks about the dialectic, we now are given a chance to go back into the allegory because when he does that, he is then going to establish a clear marking of the stages. He's going to rethink this whole thing for us and then cut it up in very interesting and precise ways. And therefore, if you're wondering about how do you decide on where you can make these marks, that's easy, we get it right out of the text. Then we're following Plato's understanding and notice the way he cuts it up. He has the most interesting way. Um, can I write that down? Get it? Um, I'm Yes, okay. Um. Let me first go to that idea of kinship and community for a moment so that we're together. If indeed our examination of all of these arts which we have been discussing brings us to consider the community and kinship between them 
and if it shows in what way they are related to one another then I think the study of them does bring us a bit towards what we want and our labor is not in vain but otherwise it is therefore the goal is to find the community and kinship between them and to see how they're related to one another that's a gigantic task says Glaucon he says oh he says, we do it it's all right he says but all of this is just a preamble it's just a preamble to get into the most interesting and the complex and the most meaningful study which is the dialectic he calls that the coping stone right that centerpiece in an arc that's what the dialect is it's that key block now when he does it he's going to go back into the allegory and by going back into the allegory he's going to divide it up into the stages now then we can see that these are stages experienced through the dialectic and that's what the allegory of the cave is going to represent because it's the stages of entering into the soul into the higher region the intelligible region and that's nothing other than becoming fully conscious of the nature of mind itself let's see how he does it Then, my dear Glaucon, this is the law at last which the dialectic brings out to its final meaning. And which being the law of mind, 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 would have a likeness in the power of sight as we described it. To look at last upon living things themselves and the stars themselves too, Finally, upon the sun itself, three, just when a man tries by discussion to get a start towards, real being, be, re, the, towards the real thing through reason without any help from the senses, when he tries to grasp by thought alone the real nature of the good itself and arrives at the very end of the world of thought, as before what we said was the end of the world of sight, Glaucon says, hey, don't you give the name dialectic to this progress of thought? Oh, oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Excuse me. Socrates says that. Glaucon says, "Yeah, that's what we call it." All right. Now he goes back. We have those four stages. He's now going to subdivide them. He's going to subdivide them. Well, there was a release from the chains. One. Turning away from the shadows to the images. and the light and an upward passage from the underground to the sun five and there's still no ability to look at living things and plants and sunlight but only upon godlike reflections in the water six and the shadows of real things seven not now shadows of images cast from another light which is compared with the sun as shadowy as they were all this did diligent study of the arts those we have been discussing has this power what power a power to stirring up and bringing out the best of the soul to survey the best of things which really are just as there it brought the clearest thing in the body to survey the most brilliant things in the bodily world of vision what do we've got we have seven stages. He gave us seven stages of the dialectic. We can then go back into it now and feel we now have a basis for cutting it up precisely the way he wants us to do it. Each one of them, therefore, is a stage of dialectic, since dialectic is a way of challenging yourself or another to enter into the game of reason, to try to understand most fully, systematically, the nature of mind, we then see there are seven stages in that process. He breaks it up into four. Remember the earlier categories were four? Hey, one, two, three, four. Understanding, belief, and image thinking. That's the four, within which you can find seven stages. That's what he's telling us. What are you doing? That's the way the soul enters into the world of mind or the intelligible reality. It must go through these four. He calls them each, each of these things. He says it again and again and again. Therefore, the goal of the dialectic is to be able to give an account of each one of these four 
image thinking, belief, understanding, knowing. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. This idea of the good, I kind of got lost there. Yeah. I missed it. No, I didn't, we haven't touched it. Oh, okay. So you're great. So, but ask you a question anyhow. No, see, there's a difference in Plato between the idea of the good and the good. The idea of the good is the eighth ox herding picture. Eighth ox herding picture. Oh, okay. Right? And the, the good itself is the tenth. Right? In the eighth ox herding picture, it's represented by a circle. That's all, right? Just a circle. What picture? Uh, if you're familiar, uh, the Chinese developed uh, originally pictures of searching for a lost ox to represent the journey of man seeking the nature of the true self. They developed six pictures that represent each of the stages in the unfoldment of that insight into the nature of oneself. Then when it moved to Japan, they added four more, so it's called the 10 ox herding pictures. And they are, interestingly enough, eight, sta eight stages through the whole thing, two preliminary, and it can be broken up into such, such fine language and distinctions that they are equally stages leading to enlightenment. And the ninth one, so each one, uh, four of them, major ones, uh, are showing man relating and trying to control, catch, get your sight of, finally control and ride the ox, which is getting to know oneself on higher and higher levels. But the eighth, there is no ox and no man, there's just a circle. And the lines, the commentary, talks about the brilliance of that. And that's, of course, the most brilliant light of being. Therefore, sometimes this is called uh, the most brilliant light of being it's also called luminosity, the experience of luminosity, divine radiance, and, and this whole allegory of the cave, you see, the whole allegory of the cave is to underscore several things, but one of the most essential things it's trying to underscore is the need to get a glimpse of this, to get a glimpse of that so you can go beyond it. I have to go beyond it, sir. And that's the good itself. See, the word to behold the good, idea of the good, is to behold the good. Therefore, it's an object of contemplation. And therefore, it has this impact, which is why he calls it the most brilliant light of being. Now, there's a, several great lines in here that one of the most difficult things to deal with uh, when you're dealing with the allegory is where he's making the distinction between the idea of the good and the good itself. And you have to be a very careful reader to see the, how he's making that distinction. And uh, it's very, very well done, very compact, very precise. So, uh, I, I, I hope I answered your question. When he goes into the state of non-knowing. That's right. The knowing beyond knowing. <laughs> That's right, because the good is not an object of knowledge. That's right. But this can be, the idea of the good can be, since that can be known. So. That's the last of all things to be known, it says in the allegory of the cave. It's the last thing of all, the sun itself. Then you reason about it and discover, hey, there's a cause behind all of this. So that's outside of experience. You're led by reflection and reading to go beyond that experience because he's leading you to the good itself. So in the cave, the allegory of the cave in the upper world, there is something that is necessarily beyond it. And that's the good itself. Sometimes called the one. I had a professor one time, I don't remember much of what I learned, but he proposed the idea that there's no such thing as good. I know, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. Now, if he's a metaphysician, he's right. If he's a normal person, he's wrong. Because the good is not, the good, the good is not an object. And in that sense, it, it can't be related to as an object. If he's a metaphysician, he's right. If he means it in the popular sense, he's foolish. Yeah, well, he was a philosopher. You know, I think he was a Platonist at the University of Washington. Well, let's hope he was a metaphysician as well. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, he just throws that at us, you know. Oh, okay. Just to make sure. Uh, the, 
it's, it's, it's a very important point. I'm very glad you brought it up. Look, uh, this, you see, the, di the goal of the dialectic in Plato's Republic is you then must turn on this experience you must turn on this experience itself and apply the dialectic. Because in that experience you are going to make certain implicit uh, claims about the very nature it is, of what it is you experience. And the most interesting one you're going to make, regardless of what tradition you're in, is that you have finally reached what is at the capital I. You finally have reached what is reality. Ultimate reality. And the goal of the dialectic is to examine that, to see the assumptions upon which that is made, what hypothesis a person is assuming when they make that claim, and to be able to uh, explore it in such a way that the person can see that those hypotheses must be rejected as he proceeds to the dialectic. Demolishing the hypothesis as it proceeds is the way he discusses it. So that one undermines the very experience in order to transcend it. And that's where the allegory of the cave finally goes, outside of the allegory of the cave in the upper world. We experience something real, and we have to undermine it to go to the next step. We have to, we have to uh, refuse what we've learned in order to go beyond the next step. Yes, and since this is the highest object of knowing, <coughs> this is the last one you pull it on. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you want, um, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, here, let me, give you a, let, me, let me give you a quote on this whole thing. He's talking about these studies, the earlier studies, and he says, uh, oh, the f and the few which do take hold of truth a little, as we said, like geometry, and those which go with it, we see they, they're in a dreamland about real being. And to perceive with a waking vision is impossible for these arts, so long as they leave untouched the hypotheses which they use and cannot give any account of them. For when a beginning is something a man does not know, and the middle and the end are woven of what he does not know, how can such a mere admission ever amount to knowledge? Then the dialectical method, the dialectic method, proceeds along by this way, demolishing the hypothesis as it goes, back to the very beginning itself, in order to find firm ground. The soul's eye, which is really buried in a sort of barbaric bog, it draws out quietly and leads upwards, having the arts we described as handmaidens and helpers. And these have often been termed sciences from habit, but we need another name. One clearer than opinion, dimmer than science, understanding. So this is the dialectic, therefore, uses the understanding as the particular way of contemplating. It's a rational, see it's a rational, intelligible contemplation that breaks through this into that about which you cannot say. Right. Uh, Buddha gives the idea, he says, the others can do it. You get across the other side, you don't need to do it anymore. Then no. <laughs> throw yeah. It away. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. So then, uh, just to pull this together, in a little more ordered form. Now, he now wants to turn to give the final dialectical exercise. And now, what he's done with the allegory, now, if, if you can still maintain some clarity with my figures superimposed on other figures, is that each one of these can be said to represent a certain phase in the parable, in the allegory. We could even make it clearer, just to make sure. All right, look here. This is what we're doing.
I'm going to put the fire here. I'm going to put the wall of the cave here. Therefore, this is image thinking and that sense of loyalty to the physical universe, which we often are urged to have in our society. Right? The fire, the source of the images being carried by the men walking along this wall. Right? That's belief. When he gets into the upper world, That's understanding. And when he finally reaches, let's make this, let's make this something like that, all right, just for our, our diagram. So therefore, the allegory then has its four divisions. The four divisions represent each of these different ways of what we call cognitive functions. Therefore, the whole goal of education is to take man from this image thinking. People who think this is the only reality of the visible world, this is the only reality, right? They're caught in the cave. That's cave life existence. Once you begin to see that you're really being guided in your thinking by certain beliefs that others have in some way engendered in you in the process of education, then that's the realm of belief. It's necessary, therefore, to see that when you're considering that this is the physical world is the only reality. It really comes from people who persuaded you of that, and you have to recognize who it was who taught you those things, under what circumstances you accepted it as true. All right. Then, breaking the bonds of that loyalty bond, you then enter into the realm of understanding. Therefore, he calls this the realm of opinion. He calls this the realm of the intelligible. Right? What is behind this, the source of this, and the source of this, and the visible world, this is the sun. This is the idea of the good. Or beyond the whole thing should be the good itself. Now, he then tells he then goes through, we're now at the end of the allegory, he then says what the goal of the dialectic must be now is that you must then be able to turn the dialectic on each one of these and talk about it in precise terms, be able to discover its origin, what maintains it. All right? And you should be able to then to see how it relates to one another and all the ways in which it can be combined. Now, remember we talked about this as an allegory. This is really... <coughs> This is cut in such very clear terms. <clears throat> the divisions between these are established in what is called Plato's divided line, which is in book six. The allegory of the cave fits the divided line. He returned to this. This is the divided line, which you take a line and you cut it you cut it into greater and lesser, right? Greater and lesser, and then you take that same ratio to the greater, the greater and lesser, and cut it proportionately. And if you do that, you will create, therefore, a mean analogy. Right? In terms of their divisions. Therefore, these two are said to be equal in some interesting way, and they are. <clears throat> now, this analogy can be transformed in four classic ways. Right? Therefore, these can be arranged in four classic ways, as represented in the following way. And okay, A is to B is B is to C. Image thinking is to belief, right? as understanding is to knowledge, that's four terms, four terms, <clears throat> but he constructed it in such a way that these two we said are equal, therefore we can call these two as equal and take them as one. 
Therefore, we can now reduce them to three terms. Therefore, we have image thinking on one extreme, one extreme, and the other extreme is knowing. And between these two, we can call it opinion. Therefore, we can say image thinking is to opinion as opinion is to knowing. These are the four ways in which you can transport. There are only four ways in which you can express these two terms. And you can compare them then in the way in which you do it and the realm of opinion, the realm of the intelligible. That's the goal of the dialectic to do that. You should then be able to relate it to the allegory because that's where you got your divisions. You should then be able to see the seven stages between it. These are the four stages. Those seven are the processes. And you put them together. That's called the allegory of the cave in the upper world. It leads the soul from that practical universe which we call it, which we've been all we often told is the goal of all of our studies, except when you get into Plato and philosophy. Um, I have a quote. I want to read the quote. Ah, there it is. We shall then be content, we are content then to call the first knowing. He uses the word science, but the word science obviously didn't exist in Plato's day, and I'm just taking that out and using the word knowing. The second understanding, the third belief, the fourth conjecture, these last two together we may, we may call opinion, and the first two the exercise of reason. Opinion is concerned with becoming, exercise of reason with being. And what is uh, to becoming? The exercise of reason is to opinion. And what the exercise of reason is to opinion? That knowing is to belief and understanding to image thinking. But let's, live, let's leave this aside, Glaucon. The proportion between these lines which represent these and the division of the opinion and the reasonable, each and two, we shall have our fill of many times the number of discussions as we've had before if we are going to explain them and make them clear to everyone, right? That's right. Right? He's reserving this. This is our task if we understand the allegory of the cave in terms of the allegory of the cave and the divided line. We should then go through making all of our, our what is it he's saying, what is being said as you take each one of these and represent them in this way then you're seeing what it's like to relate all the different aspects of mind. These are the different cognitive functions of mind. You're seeing, therefore, how each of the, the levels or the functions of the mind and its four classifications can be said to be related one to the other. That's the goal of the dialectic. What does it relate then? Relates to the allegory of the cave in the upper world. That relates to the divided line. And now, Last step. Remember the title of this lecture? I said I misrepresented it. I represented it originally as Plato's allegory for the training of the soul. But you see what it really is is Plato's Republic as the allegory for the training of the soul. This is saying Plato's Republic as the allegory for the training of the soul. You can put the whole Republic in it. I'll show you what that means. We should be able to now go back into the Republic and see where he talks about each one of these in the Republic. We should be able to go back into it and see what the people are going through as they go through the ten books of the Republic and what he's saying about people in each one of these books. You know what we can do then? We can use this as a table of contents. We can cut out certain, certain key sections of the Republic and glue it right into our allegory of the cave in the upper world. Then we can take the greater divisions and see what he's saying about each one of these, cut them out, then we can see the processes going through. Remember the seven processes we talked about? We should be able to go back in the Republic and look for examples right in the Republic where each one of these things is being discussed. 
you can do that. That's understanding Plato's Republic as the allegory of the cave in the upper world, as the training of the soul into the realm of the mind. Thank you. Questions? Grace. Process, which almost to me means almost a mechanical process. That's what a method is. It's reduced to some kind of what appears to be mechanical. That's right. And that's right. That's why I'm crossing it. That's right. Grace, that's right. That's right. Well, that's right. Yeah, this is like it. This is an intellectual yoga. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Only it's intellectual rather than mechanical. But it's the same idea. Same idea. That's right. So there isn't any. Yeah, at the end there is grace when it gets into that higher state. What you call it? Well, you have to well, yeah. yeah, he has an idea. It's not here, though. He has the idea of providence that plays a role of grace. But here he's talking about the training of the soul to reach in, into each of these functions, and since he can define each one. He thinks you can actually experience each one of these and it's worth training the soul to experience each one of them. That's what he's doing. At other places, he does have the idea of providence, which is an idea of grace. Yeah, but not here. This is a training ground. It's a very strict contemplative technique. Yeah. Oh, what causes people to be in that bottom stage? Well, of course, you're very good at asking the best questions. That's the real question, isn't it? That's right. That's right. They can't see one another. They can't see themselves. All they see is reflections of themselves, shadows. They also see above that <coughs> parapet, raised wall, raised platform, men, but they cannot be seen because there's a wall separating them, and they carry these images. The light behind casts these images equally well on the wall of the cave. Well, I'm going to translate it for you oh, okay. in order to keep it going, okay. all right? Because I thought I could, if I could relate it back to the allegory of the okay. cave, then we can do two to one. Okay. All right. These things, he says, come and go, pass. He calls it the visible world. We are taught that the visible world is our reality. That's the first step. If you accept the visible world to be the reality, that belief will keep you chained. Next, all right? These images are images of man that are cast on the wall of the cave. Therefore, if we accept these images of man as our ideals, that will keep us fixed. There are men that walk back and forth that talk to one another and their voices bounce off the wall of the cave and it appears to be animating these very voices. So therefore these men have a voice and the prisoners, called prisoners, believe these voices to be the, um, or the images, the images they believe to be real have voices, and these voices are nothing other than these men who talk back and forth to one another. So what? Later he talks about the poets and the people who go from town to town giving performances of both rhetoric as well as the tragedies and Homer, and they have images of man 
the men who carry these images talk to one another, which these men believe are really anim being animated from the wall of the cave. Ah. Homer has an ideal of man which is taught. Number one. He then, in book two, he says also families have their own particular traditions and they have an ideal which they obviously inculcate into their own families. Society has its images, ideals. The acceptance of these ideals as real is what locks you up in the cave. For the honors, the honors that can be awarded for people who are skilled in understanding and manipulating the visible world, the honors and the rewards they give, so long as they are thought to be significant and worthwhile, to that degree, that's a chain. These are the four chains. These are what binds men. Put it in modern terms, religious views, Certain religious views bind men. Certain family beliefs rob them of their vitality and their higher goals. Certain society ideals keep men down, don't allow them to develop maximally. Right? Being attracted to the rewards and the values produced by our culture as rewards for people who can manipulate, and maintain, and control the visible world. So long as you consider those to be significant, that will trap you. These are the four things. Well, of the visible world that these chains will appear uh, oh. that, uh, in a sense using that word mechanical again uh, uh, oh yeah there is something you're quite right there is something about this visible world that makes us think it's real got to be real uh, uh, and I'm saying I, it's, it's not like these four chains are some kind of conspiratorial conspiracy. Oh, no. it's, oh, uh, oh. Uh, it's uh, one can disagree with a uh, religion, but the fact is that I respect religions enough that they are s s seriously struggling with a hard question and are trying to respond to it the best they can. Oh, sure. The only question in this is whether or not these beliefs block someone who wants to explore and get into the mind. Because these produce beliefs which at certain times and circumstances can restrict one's ability or can certainly can restrict one's uh, desire to achieve. Certainly does that, doesn't it? Certain of them, at certain times. My sister used to wonder why I was searching. She says, all you have to do is believe. Our church gives you all the beliefs you need. You can understand why I was searching. So the beliefs were, were sufficient Okay, that's right, that's right. She believed if you believed you had the Holy Spirit, you had it. Okay. So that's, so that's a belief that will keep her where she is. So we're, we're not saying that these people are wrong. We're saying that if you're interested in developing the mind for this kind of vision, right. then you have to then take a look at what's blocking your own intellectual progress towards this higher vision. <coughs> if it takes an intellectual if it takes an intellectual contemplation, then the mind has to be and match that intellectual process. Therefore, it has to examine all of its beliefs and why it holds what it does to be true and it must therefore shift its goals accordingly. It's not religion, it's not what we would call religion. Though this is very clearly a spiritual tradition, but it's not a religion if you make the distinction between religion and, and spiritual traditions. A religion is what binds people together, binds people together into some kind of a community, usually based upon some belief. A spiritual tradition is different from that because it espouses the need to reach higher stage of consciousness and it doesn't depend upon primary beliefs as the, the basic and overriding element. So they're different. Right? Certainly 
But that's for that reason, you can have some people who are religious that are not spiritual. You can have some people who are spiritual, not religious. You can have some philosophies that are not religious. You can have some philosophies that are spiritual. This is a, Plato is a philosophical system within a, within a spiritual tradition. That's not a religious tradition, but a spiritual tradition called the Neoplatonic tradition or the Platonic tradition. Again, could you break down the difference between spiritual and religious? comes from religio. The word religion comes from religio. That means to bind together. The nature of that bind or that bond is belief. <clears throat> All right, that means that there is a certain class of things called belief which when people hold in common it binds them together and they can recognize the kinship among them. Next, that belief has to say, one way or the other, that belief in itself is sufficient. That nothing else beyond that is required. This is, of course, in Christianity, the Pauline doctrine. Uh, now, the spiritual tradition... <coughs> works on the assumption that whatever beliefs are there, they are only a tool to reach a range of profound experiences. And these profound experiences are higher states of consciousness. Now, why are they higher states of consciousness? They're not really. Consciousness is consciousness. It's just that these other states of mind inhibit, inhibit the free flow, flow, flow of consciousness and its appropriate object. That's what it does. So therefore, the difference between the two, I think, can be represented in this way. Religions bind people together through belief. Spiritual traditions have some way of developing uh, higher, more profound experiences or states of consciousness. That help? Okay, and then what about mystic mysticism? That's here. And that's why the church always has a problem with mystics in the Christian church, Christian community, and other organized religions, because they're going to base what they say on their own inward experiences and, con and states of consciousness rather than on traditional beliefs. So this is the realm of, yeah, Plato is a mystic, uh, Socrates is mystic. He, that's what he calls himself. And the Phaedo, he calls himself a mystic. Well, most of us don't have our voices that yeah, I, I wish I could sell one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. That's very true. As a matter of fact, um, uh, one of the important things to understand in this whole Platonic game is that very point. That so what is, who is, who is Socrates? What is he really? And uh, thank goodness I'm going to talk about that when we get in the Apology, because that's the whole goal of the Apology, to, to position Socrates in respect to the difference between these two, and why he's here, and what's the implications of it. That's what he's doing. So, yeah, that's right. Yes, and the point you raised about <clears throat> voices, Socrates did have a voice. He had it from childhood. And the significance of that, we will certainly play with. I can touch on it now. There's a difference between being Socratic and being Platonic. You can't choose, you cannot elect to be a Socratic figure. You cannot elect to be a Socratic philosopher. You can elect yourself to be a Platonic philosopher, but not a Socratic. And that one, that's the difference between grace, if you want, and vocation. Because he sees that he has been commanded by God to be a philosopher from his earliest days. And there aren't many applications for local colleges where you can elect to be a major in philosophy. And one of the requirements is not that you feel that, or you have some evidence, or you have some appeal to the fact that God chose you to be a philosopher, right? That's not one of the items you check off. 
I, I don't think it is. But for Plato, so you can be a Platonic. You can be Platonic, but you can't be Socratic. I don't remember. They asked Socrates what made him different than other people. And I, don't, I can't give his answer exactly, but you probably remember it better than I do. He said other people think they know. Yeah. But I know that I don't know something. Yes, that's a, that's a very great, very great quote. Yeah. The difference between me and others, he says, is that I know that I do not know, but they do not know that they do not know. And therefore he then changes it to, uh, I know what I do not know. Now that's a big difference between I know what I do not know and I do not know. Yeah, and on that hangs a big discussion. Yeah, good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you.